So we're doing something a bit different today. We're actually out birding with a $25 lens that I bought off eBay. I really kind of wanted to get into birding and uh, photography of wildlife and birds lately, but if you're gonna get serious about it and really get close to the action, for the most part, you need a lens somewhere in the three to 400 millimeter range. And ideally something that is, is 400 millimeter as a fixed focal length. Now, if you go and even look at and the cheapest modern 400 millimeter fixed focal length lenses, you're talking literally thousands of dollars for these lenses. That really wasn't an option for me, particularly since I don't even know if I'm going to enjoy this or if this is something that I want to take up. So I went on eBay, did some research, and uh, what I found was, was this. It is a vintage 400 millimeter lens. It's an all metal build. It has extremely smooth focus. It has a built-in lens hood, and I'll just show you that. And this is just a real beast of a lens. Like, I mean, you just look at that front element. It's absolutely huge. I mean, it's just got this massive front element, and um, just using it is, is really quite a, a cool experience. Just putting it on your camera and having a lens of this size and this sort of focal length is pretty neat. Now with these vintage lenses, one thing you gotta know is it's gonna be manual focus, which this one is. Uh, you're gonna have to get an adapter to adapt it to your camera. Uh, now one of the neat things is for the most part you can adapt almost any of these vintage lenses to any modern camera now. And that fact, particularly mirrorless cameras, and that fact has actually made some of these vintage lenses go up in value. And it is the one good thing of buying a vintage telephoto lens right now it's unlikely that that lens will ever be worth less than what you're paying right now. So even if you get it and use it for a while and decide that it's not for you, that lens isn't for you, or this type of photography isn't for you, you're probably gonna find that you're gonna be able to sell it when you're done with it and, and maybe even make money on it because the price of these vintage lenses is definitely going up. A few years ago, they were literally worthless. And the only reason I was able to get this one uh, so cheaply is because it has got a little bit of damage to the outside and inside the lens I can see someone sort of taken it apart at some point and tried to clean it or do something and there's a whole bunch of smear across the inside of the glass. Now with any of these vintage lenses one of the things that you are going to have to do is stop it down a fair bit to actually get the sharpest image from it. And this one I have been using at f11 and that's pretty much okay for me because I'm mostly going to be using it in high light conditions. It's not something that you, I would be able to use and get a sharp image, you know, sort of at sunset or at daybreak. But in the middle of the day, um, just in the shade, in the trees, there's going to be enough light there that I can shoot this at f11 and the ISO won't go, go too high and it, it should be quite usable. And I've just shot a series of shots of... Uh, some cockatoos that I came across um, just in Melbourne, Australia, just at a suburban park outside the city. And I came across some cockatoos sort of playing and going in and out of this rotted out tree trunk. And it was, uh, it was really cool. And, and I think the shots turned out pretty good. Anyways, um, I didn't actually plan on seeing those birds when we first got here. So we're going to walk around now. I'm going to take you around. We're going to have a play with the lens and we're going to see what sort of shots we can get with this $25 lens. I'm seeing some really cool parrots in these trees, but man, it's just, it's hard with the dappled shade of the gum trees. So I'm just gonna try to get this guy here now. Yeah, he's, I think he's eating something out of the, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> That'll be so shaky. Might have to stabilize this. Yeah, he's definitely eating or digging something out of there. It's just a little green parrot. I think he's actually digging. He's like digging into the tree like he's trying to get to something or... It, you can see... I'm gonna put this back on video. He's... It's like he's digging something out or taking something off the tree. He's dropping it to the side. Like he's peeling the bark off the tree. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's amazing being able to get so close to him and he's got like no idea I'm here. 
Oh, there's two of them now. All right, let's see if we can find something else. There's, an, uh, there's a blackbird up here just doing the same thing as those little parrots were just doing. It's pulling the bark off the tree. There must be some sort of insects underneath the bark that they're trying to get to because those, the parrots back there, they were just peeling them off and dropping it to the side. So that wasn't what they were going for. They must be peeling the bark off these trees. And I'll just show you. Yeah, it's like a stringy, it's called a stringy bark or paper bark, but yeah, it just, there must be insects under there and that's what they're after. And I'm really just trying to find birds that'll be sort of more interesting to my North American audience because that's most people that watch this channel. Uh, but you know, parrots obviously be something to be interesting. We've got a few different native species of birds, kookaburras, it'd be cool if we saw one of those. Uh, we also have sparrows and blackbirds and crows, ravens, things that are pretty common in North America as well. Seagulls, of course. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to try to find the stuff that'll be interesting to people in North America, birds that you wouldn't see in your own backyard. I just got a shot of a bird that, uh, I think it's called a bellbird or something. They really get spooked easily. I've never actually tried to photograph one before, but but whenever you're around they just take off like you just don't get them to stay around so i wasn't actually able to talk you through when i was taking those photos but um i hope i got some pretty good shots and i tried to get some a little bit of a video clip as well and if you're interested in more videos like this if you're interested in birding or budget birding stuff just let me know it's kind of a fun way to get out and just get out of the house and go for a night's walk and i kind of just in the few hours that I've been out today, I kind of understand that birding isn't just about the birds. It's actually about just getting outside, getting in touch with nature, giving yourself a reason to go for a walk. And yeah, I'm really enjoying the, the hunt of trying to find the birds. It's pretty cool actually. All right, I've just come across a few more of those little green parrots. It's the technical term, little green parrots. And um, yeah, I'm going to try to get a bit of a closer shot because they're not far away. One of the challenges with a, with a huge 400 millimeter lens like this is when I'm getting as close as I am right now, I'm getting a really good close up, but actually trying to find the bird in the bush with such a zoomed in i'm having to search all over to try to find it uh, the other thing i've got to watch is this particular lens has a minimum focus distance of 14 feet which i'm getting pretty close to and yeah there were times earlier today where i kind of had to back off because it was getting too close to the birds but yeah, I'll be very interested to see how those turn out. The other thing I would say about having a manual focus lens is in situations like where I just took those photos where the bird is kind of in the bush, even if you had an autofocus lens, I don't think there's an autofocus system in the world that is going to deal with getting a bird in focus that's buried inside a bush like that. You're going to have to manually focus that anyway. So having a manual focus lens like this, which is super accurate, super smooth, and was was built to manual focus, unlike modern lenses, which are really built to autofocus, and then the manual focus is focused by wire, so there's no direct connection between the focus mechanism and the lenses. It just says the person's turning the thing, go ahead and move the focus element. Where this, you can be much more precise with a vintage manual focus lens when manual focusing. So in, in this situation, I actually find this setup to be a significant advantage. All right, we're gonna go try to find one more and uh, then we'll get them home and have a look on the computer and I'll finish up the video sort of talking about uh, what I thought of the lens when I get back to the studio. I got just a few more shots I just took of this little bird. Well, he's gone already. <laughs> sitting on the fence post behind me. Uh, I was at such a distance that I couldn't even really tell what kind of bird it was. But then with the 400 millimeter lens, I actually got in close enough and it looked completely different than what I thought. So I think that's enough for today. I'm gonna head home, get them on the computer, and then I'll come back and I'll talk to you about the lens, how I think it performed, and what I think of the photos once I get a chance to review them. So now I've had a look at all the photos and here's my verdict on this lens. First of all, 
easily the best $25 I've ever spent. I mean, this is definitely worth more than $25. The only reason this lens was so cheap is because there was some smudging or cleaning marks or something around the inside of the front element, but it was only a ring around the front edge. And since I'm using an APS-C sensor camera, it's not going to use that part of the lens. The APS-C camera only uses the sort of center part of a full frame lens. So I kind of didn't worry about that and knew that it really shouldn't have much effect on the image quality and I don't think it did. Normally you can find this lens in good condition anywhere between 80 and $150, sometimes a little bit cheaper, sometimes a little bit more, but that's really the going rate for this lens on eBay in, in better condition than the one I had. And in my final judgment to this lens, I'm going to kind of, as a bit of fun, but also unfairly, compare it to what you would get if you spent the $1,000 or $2,000 on the modern equivalent of this lens. And the first thing is, there's absolutely no doubt that this lens is not as sharp as the modern equivalent. And I didn't expect it to be. But when stopped down, it did get some reasonably good sharp images and certainly enough for my purposes for the money I spent on this lens. The other thing you lose is you don't get autofocus. It's a manual focus only lens, so that's something you're going to have to live with, learn to love manual focus. And in the short time that I used the lens, actually I found it a real pleasure to use. I thought the manual focus was actually made me more in touch with the camera and the scene that I was trying to capture. And I really enjoyed using the manual focus on this lens. But you better because autofocus isn't going to be an option for you. And the final thing is, to get reasonable image sharpness with these modern high pixel density sensor cameras, you really are gonna to have to stop the aperture down. So in doing so, you're gonna to have to be shooting at F8 or F11, so you're really closing off the amount of light that is coming in and getting to your sensor, which means you're going to eliminate doing anything but middle of the day, high sun, really good lighting conditions. So you are gonna lose the ability to shoot in marginal or low light conditions, just in order to get some decent sharpness out of this lens. This lens does go to f5.6, which isn't that slow, but to get any sort of reasonable sharpness, you really need to be at f8 or f11. And let's talk about what you do get with this lens that you don't get with the modern equivalent. And the first thing is, you're gonna be paying somewhere between two and 5% of the price of the modern equivalent of this lens. For somebody like me, this is a situation where this is the only way I'm getting into this style of photography. I don't have the money or the commitment to this style of photography, at least not right now, to spend that money on the modern equivalent. So the price is obviously huge, and for me, it was first and foremost in my mind when I bought this lens. The next thing you're getting out of this lens, which is something I really didn't think about before I used it, is the character like it really has the photos have some sort of soul to them they, they really are beautiful and they aren't rendered like a, a modern camera lens it, and it's not just the softness like the background blur is kind of amazing and they're less contrasty and there's something about them that is really kind of magical and and after reviewing the photos, the first thing I'm thinking, I want to take this on the street. I want to try this for street photography. I want to try this for a portrait. I want to try this for a whole bunch of different things and, and just make use of that character that this lens provides. I thought it was, it was really interesting and I really enjoyed the results from this compared to the clinical, sharp, somewhat sterile images I get out of my better high-end new modern lenses. The other thing with this lens is it's actually, although it is quite big and metal, it's still smaller than a lot of the modern equivalents and it's also lighter than a lot of the modern equivalents. It's also better built than a lot of the modern equivalents. So it does actually have, even if the prices were the same, it does have some things that they don't have. And those three things I think are key. And I think there could even be situations where you have the modern version of it and you might be able to justify carrying around the vintage 400 millimeter just for those few advantages of the vintage lens. And the last thing I'll say about using a lens like this, for me, this is huge. It is the satisfaction of taking something 
that is so old, disused, potentially discarded, giving it new life and then producing really unique results, something that's totally different, something that people can't recreate with an Instagram filter, something that breaks away from the sterile, crisp, sharp-edged lines of the images we get out of the modern lenses. So I really got a lot of satisfaction, not only from the images that this produced, but also from the usage of it, the, the way the manual focus feels in your hand. It really was an absolute pleasure to use. So would I recommend this to someone else? Absolutely, particularly if you could find one of these lenses in good condition at or around the $100 mark. First of all, I can't see how you'd possibly go wrong. And secondly, if you don't like it and it's not the thing for you, you'll easily resell it and get your money back. So I hope this video was helpful. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the journey with me. We'll see you in the next one.